Hey, good morning. Do me a favor, let's open up together in the book of Acts chapter 2 as we continue our studies through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. As you turn into Acts chapter 2, you know those, those times where you go to the beach and maybe you're surfing or you're, you're body surfing, you're out in the water, and you sense a, a pull at your feet and you realize that a big wave is coming in. I just want to encourage you that I sense that this morning and God poured out His Spirit in a very special way here during the first service, and I believe that God is going to continue to do that in this service. I'm excited for what God wants to do here. Amen. Acts chapter 2. You know, there are some uh, uh, behaviors that occur in very Pentecostal churches that may be a concern. And some are, are a concern to me. For example, when a, a church turns on a fog machine and says that it's the Shekinah glory of God, the presence of God, uh, that is something that is being contrived. And, and so that would be a concern for me. If people are barking in the spirit or roaring like lions, that, that may be a concern. When I, I see people lining up to uh, receive the baptism of the spirit and a pastor or leader is uh, laying a hand on their forehead and people are falling like dominoes. And, and I, I have concern because I, I don't necessarily see those manifestations in the Bible. But as I, I think of some of these potential abuses that are being claimed to be works of the Holy Spirit collectively, some of these things in, in very Pentecostal or charismatic places have me concerned, and, and as I look at them, I, I give them a letter D, and let me explain to you why I give them a D. I think that, that first of all, they can detract from the true work of the Holy Spirit. I believe that they can be a deterrent to the true work of the Holy Spirit. I think they can be a discouragement to the true work of the Holy Spirit. I believe they can be dangerous because they become a, a fixation rather than what I believe the Bible shows is the true work of the Holy Spirit. And I, I believe that there's a doctrinal issue because we exalt some experience that we're searching for to the neglect of biblical doctrine and growing up in the knowledge of Christ. And so I'm not saying that they're, they're all wrong or they're not of the Holy Spirit. I just have some concerns about certain manifestations and just generally speaking we'll give it a letter D. Now let me tell you nevertheless what I'm equally concerned about perhaps more concerned about that is deserving of a letter F for failure. The great failure in the church is to seek to live the Christian life with ignorance of the work of the Holy Spirit or with knowledge of of the work of the Holy Spirit, neglecting the work of the Holy Spirit, to try to live the Christian life apart from the indwelling empowerment, the filling of the Holy Spirit is a failure. It leads to frustration. It does not rightly represent God. It misrepresents God. And we lack the power in our strength and our flesh to do what only God can do in and through us by His Spirit. And that's why Jesus told His disciples, wait until... Wait in Jerusalem until you have received the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit has come upon you, then you shall be my witnesses here in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and the outermost parts of the world. And there's some of you that sitting here today is like, I, I don't know anything about the Holy Spirit and, and I'm not sure that I want to know about the Holy Spirit. And in knowing about the Holy Spirit, I don't know what to do. And there's some of you who, yes, I know about the Holy Spirit. I know all about the Holy Spirit, but you're not living in the power of the Spirit. It's not purely an intellectual issue, and it's certainly not a spiritual issue. Or excuse me, it is a spiritual issue. You guys are supposed to catch me on that before I catch me on that. Did he just say what I think he just said? It's a spiritual issue, not an emotional issue. And yet, I believe that God wants to do something in and through our lives that would bring glory to his name through the power of his spirit. Would you stand with me as we take a look together? We're in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read beginning at verse 1 and ask you if you would just to silently follow along. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all 
filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let's pray. Father, by your Spirit, you desire to make the pages of this book come alive. You've declared to us that your word is alive and that it is sharper than a two-edged sword. Father, I pray that you would soften our hearts, that we would receive all that you want to do in and through our lives today. I pray that you would open our eyes to spiritual truth, open our ears to spiritual truth, open our hearts to receive all that you want to do in and through us today for your glory. And so, Father, uh, I have no impressive words. I, I don't want to try to reason to the intellect, to the exclusion of the Spirit, I pray, Father, for you to move by your Spirit to bring people to you in a way that is profound, in a way that is demonstrative of you, in a way that transforms us for our contentment, but more importantly, for your glory. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. And please be seated. So, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about the power of the Spirit manifest at Pentecost and confusion. Uh, the power of the Spirit manifest at Pentecost and confusion. And what we hope to, to see, what I believe God intends, is that we would understand the work of the Holy Spirit. And in understanding the work of the Holy Spirit, that we would seek and receive the filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit today. So the first thing that we want to consider is the, the Spirit of God being manifest. And, and as the Spirit of God is being manifest, we'll discover as we continue through this passage at verse 12 that the people ask, what does this mean? What is this? Now, imagine, uh, Pentecost is one of three major feasts in the Jewish calendar. The spring feasts include Passover, and then approximately 50 days later is Pentecost. In the fall, there was the Feast of Tabernacles. And so Jews throughout the Roman Empire, throughout the known world, are, are commanded to come to Jerusalem to worship. So imagine you're in Jerusalem, and, and there within the walled city, there's over a million people. There's Solomon's temple that had been expanded then by Herod that is glorious to behold. It is marble, and there's gold overlay, and it is considered one of the wonders of the ancient world. It's beautiful to behold, and it looks so stable. And so you see the site of the temple at the Temple Mount there at Mount Moriah. You see the, the glory of God's people gathering. You hear the sounds of worshipers coming to praise God. You smell the aroma of sacrifices that had been offered up to God. And in the midst of this site that is marvelous and wonderful, that you see, that you hear, that you smell. God is going to do something on that day that was so radical for those people and should be for us as well that we say, what is this? What does it mean? And what must I do to receive it? We read at verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. And the first thing we want to consider is, what is the Feast of Pentecost? Well, the Feast of Pentecost is celebrated, let's say, roughly 50 days after Passover. And I want you to understand that all of these feasts point to Jesus. And let me just give you some context. Passover was Good Friday. Passover is the day that Christ is crucified. And then the, the first day after the Sabbath is the Feast of First Fruits. That's Resurrection Sunday in this case. Good Friday, the cross at Calvary. Three days later, Resurrection Sunday, the Feast of First Fruits. And then 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits is the Feast of Pentecost. It's celebrated or commemorated the bringing in of the wheat harvest, which is crucial, critical to this agrarian culture. But not only that, commemorates the giving of the law. The Mosaic law, which God's chosen people, the Jews, used as a means to relate to God. And here at Pentecost, we're moving not only from commemorating Passover with Good Friday, commemorating the Feast of First Fruits with the resurrection, but Pentecost, the commemoration of the giving of the law, is now a celebration of the giving of the Spirit, is the birth of His church, and God is signaling that we are no longer relating to God through the works of the law, but primarily we are relating to God through the work of the Holy Spirit. 
Paul, when he wrote to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, he, he's saying, look, we're no longer seeking to relate to God through the law, but through the Spirit. The law brings death. The Spirit gives life. And to understand this and, and to uh, appreciate the significance of this. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, believers were always saved by faith, through the grace of God. It was a gift through faith. People in the Old Testament weren't saved by following the Mosaic law. The purpose of the law was to show us that we were sinners who need a Savior. The purpose of the law today is to show us that we are sinners who need a Savior, and Christ is that Savior, Messiah, who reconciles us to God. But the tendency in the Old Testament was to relate to God through law. Let me give you an example. We understand in Exodus 20, where we read of the Ten Commandments, that one of those Ten Commandments is that we're to observe the Sabbath. For the Jews, the Sabbath was observed from Friday night at Sunday, uh, sundown rather, to Saturday night at sundown. In the church, as we observe our Sabbath, we're, we're not told what day. It can be any day. The principle of the Sabbath is that we're to honor God with considerable chunks of time to worship God, to set aside the distractions of our routine. And so in Exodus 20, the Jews are told, you're not going to work on the Sabbath day. You'll do no manner of work. And so the question becomes, what is a work? And great volumes of rabbinical interpretation trying to define what is a work. And people looking for the boundary. Example, how far can I walk before it's work? And the rabbi said, you can walk for approximately three quarters of a mile. So you make a journey, a Sabbath day journey. You, you couldn't go any further because then it had been a work because this law tradition had been established by the rabbis. Now it's work. Well, can I make a fire and cook on the Sabbath? And the rabbi says, no, kindling a fire is a work. So you can't make a fire and cook on the Sabbath because that's work. Now, Interesting. When I was a boy growing up, a young boy, uh, we grew up as Orthodox Jews. And so in our apartment, there were a lot of other Jewish believers because we walked to a synagogue. And so the, near the synagogue would be a densely populated area of people who were part of that community of faith. And the reason why we lived in areas close to the synagogue was that you wouldn't drive to the synagogue. You had to walk to the synagogue. And the question becomes, why would you walk instead of driving and let me explain? explain because the rabbi said to start a fire is work and so when you turn the ignition in your gas operated car that creates a spark that in essence starts a, a fire create combustion and so the rabbi says you can't drive because that's a fire and going back to all the tradition back to the the fathers they said that that's a work now i would submit to you it takes more work to walk for three quarters of a mile than to turn an ignition but you can see then, when you're trying to follow the letter of the law, the tendency to miss the intent of the law. To give you a sense. One of our neighbors, who was a dear friend and was growing up, he was all things Chicago. And because he was all things Chicago, he loved the Bulls, the Bears, the Cubs. And because he loved all things sports, all things Chicago, you see the rabbi says that turning on the TV, you can't do it on the Sabbath. Well, he got around that by bringing a Gentile into the apartment to turn on the TV. <laughs> so you say, I didn't turn it on. It just, you know, magically turned on. You, you see, so again, observance of the letter of the law, I didn't do any work, totally missing the intent or the spirit of the law. And you see, in the church, we, we are not designed to relate to God through the letter of the law. We have the law to guide us in God's boundaries, but we're seeking to relate to God by the spirit of the law. Now, let me tell you, you know, it, it's just as dangerous in the church when we seek to observe by the letter of the law because what we do then is we create loopholes, exceptions for ourselves, and we justify our behavior. For example, if you say, in the New Testament, I am saved by grace through faith alone. That is a truth. And, and so you, you can convince yourself, I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need to pray. 
I don't need to serve. I don't need to be in community with anybody else. I don't need to give of my resources to advance God's kingdom because it's all about grace. And so you're looking to the letter of the law to avoid the responsibility that God puts in your heart by his spirit. And we quench the spirit. And we grieve the spirit. But we justify it because we look to a law and we look to loopholes or exceptions. For example... The issue of pornography. The issue of pornography, unfortunately, is an epidemic problem within the church, beyond the church. You have single people. You have married people struggling. It tends to be more prevalent with men than with women, but it, it involves both. So if you have a married man who's struggling w- with pornography and, and says to his wife, well, I was thinking about you while I was looking at her Not only has he taken another human being created in God's image and and reduced that person to an object, but now he's lusting and being dominated by his flesh or she is being dominated by her flesh and justifying by saying, look, it it wasn't fornication. I wasn't having sex outside of the marriage relationship. It wasn't adultery as a married person having sex with somebody. I didn't commit the act. And you see, again, We've missed because we're looking to create by the letter of the law an exception that misses the whole spirit of the law. God did not design you and me as New Testament believers to be led by the law, but to be led by the spirit. And and so this is why the Holy Spirit is poured out at Pentecost, because we're to relate to God by his spirit. Then we see the manifestation of the Spirit, uh, the signaling that the promise of the Father had now come, the new birth of the new church. At verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. The sound like a rushing mighty wind. In the Greek language, the word pneuma is translated wind. It's also translated spirit. Similarly, in the Hebrew language, the word ruach is translated wind. And it's also translated spirit. So God is manifesting that he is outpouring his spirit through this rushing mighty wind. That all will sense that something has happened. There's an auditory something manifest that all observe as they're gathered in the upper room the spirit is poured out like a rushing mighty wind and it draws people's attention and then the appearance of fire verse 3 then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them so you can just imagine this scene There's 120 of the believers in the upper room. They hear this immense sound of a rushing mighty wind as as the Spirit is moving. And then upon the heads of others, you would see these cloven tongues of fire. You would see the presence of flame. It wasn't that your head started burning up. It wasn't like you're getting a hot head. Woo, 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 put that up. It it was the, the presence of God being manifest. And you couldn't see it on your own head, but you could see it on other people's head, and they could see it on yours. Now, what was that? What was going on there? In uh, verse 3, we see this outpouring like fire. Fire is, is a visible way that God's presence is manifest. For example, Exodus chapter 3, we see that Moses is drawn to this bush that's on fire, but it's not being consumed. It's not being burned up. And then God speaks to him and says, take your sandals off. The ground that you're standing on is holy. That fire is the very presence of God being manifest. Similarly, As the Jews were being brought from Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land, God led them by day by a pillar of cloud and by night by a pillar of fire. The very presence of God manifest. Now, whenever I have an opportunity to to teach Acts chapter 2 about this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that, that was so manifest in such a tangible, powerful way that all people knew that something had happened, I I just God, if you want to cause an earthquake right now, that'd be so cool. No, Pastor, don't pray for that. Or or just rock the room. Let something happen so dramatic that everybody would know. But I want to encourage you. That's the subtle trap that we're trying to avoid. It's not something marvelously dramatic that is the filling of the Holy Spirit. 
But I will submit to you, when the Holy Spirit has been poured out, it will be manifest and it will be obvious and the transformation will be real. And so the next thing that happens is we read that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit at verse 4. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it is the power to represent and live for Christ and his kingdom. The power to represent, to live for Christ, and for his kingdom. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, When you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, outermost parts of the world. It is the power to live the Christian life as empowered by God's Spirit to represent him, to live for him, and to advance God's kingdom. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul addresses the filling of the Spirit. He says, look, don't be drunk with wine, which pushes you away from God. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, controlled by the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then beginning in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, to Ephesians chapter 6 at verse 10, Paul begins to explain what that looks like. First of all, he talks about it in the marriage relationship. He says, when the Spirit of God is controlling, then wives are going to want to respect and honor their husbands and allow their husbands to lead, which is challenging for any woman, especially the way some of us guys lead. Amen? It's so nice to hear men's voices say amen there, too. I know the ladies all wanted to say amen. That was good. But then men are going to love their brides as Christ loves the church. That implies that, first of all, men would seek to discern how does Christ love his church and recognize, I can't do that. I don't understand my wife. I can't do that. But empowered by the Holy Spirit would begin to demonstrate love towards their bride as Christ loved the church more and more with every passing season. And then Paul continues and he says, look, when the Spirit of God is filling, you're controlled by the Spirit. This is how it will be manifest in your family. Fathers, parents are going to bring their kids up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Parents will actually disciple their children to grow in the things of God. And in doing so, that they will not provoke their children to wrath. We'll stop parenting in such a way that make our, our, our kids a offended by us and resent us and are driving them away, but our parenting will be changed in such a way that we are loving our kids and discipling them and mentoring them that they could be strong in the Lord, that that next generation would turn God's world right side up. And then he says, as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it'll be characteristic in your workplace or in your school, in your life. He says that if you're an employer, a supervisor, someone with authority in the workplace, that you will respect those who are under you and you will honor them. And if you're an employee as a Christian, whether your boss is or is not a Christian, whether your boss treats you well or not, you will work hard, that you'll represent Christ in your workplace, and that you will honor and respect your supervisor, whether they're respectable or not. And you look at this like, I can't do that. Exactly. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you, I've been a pastor for a score, 20 plus years. I've been married for 20 plus years. I love my bride. I've been blessed. We had a a conference here, Friday night, Saturday night, The Art of Marriage. It was fantastic. I I just want to encourage you. If you've never gone, next time it's offered, you got to go. If you're in a marriage relationship, you're contemplating a marriage relationship, you're thinking about it, it's a fantastic resource. We, we discovered that one marriage that, that was ripe for divorce, that they were restored. We heard testimony of, of four people who got saved at this conference, and I'm sure countless other marriages were strengthened, encouraged, edified. But on the, oh, we can do that there. That's good. Yeah, that's good. I should stop lo- talking long enough to allow you to do that. I just like 300 words. Maybe. Breathe, Bruce, breathe. It's good for you. All right. So, the first night, we have these workbooks and exercise. So my bride and I, we leave from the first night, and, and we're going to stop, and, and we're going to go through this workbook together. And on our way over, and it's a very short drive, we, we start having contention, conflict, intense fellowship. 
And despite the fact that my wife was presumably clearly wrong, she didn't feel that she needed to apologize. I, I don't know why. And you know, here, here's what the, the first reaction was. We, we started to talk. We started to communicate. We started to want to explain to one another what motivated us and, and so that we would have better understanding. And we went through that process to seek peace, but here was what was missing. The first thing that we should have done was, Lord, I need your spirit. I don't want to respond in my flesh. Right now, my flesh is controlling, and you want to control the situation by your spirit. You want to bring peace by your spirit, Lord. Fill me with your spirit that I can respond to my wife with understanding. Fill me with your spirit that I could love her, Lord, as you love the church. Thank you for her in my life. She's a gift from you, God. You, you see what I'm, I'm saying? We need the Holy Spirit in our marriage, in our family, at your school, at your job, in your community. But not only that, you, you need the Holy Spirit to discern your calling and to do your calling. Now think about this for a moment. Remember when Jesus begins his public ministry? It happens at the Jordan River. Jesus' segue into his public ministry is the baptism at the Jordan River by John the Baptist. And as Jesus is being baptized, God the Father pours out the Holy Spirit in the presence of a dove, the, the form of a dove. The Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus, anointing him, filling him, that he can walk in his ministry, his calling. Amen? Now see this with me. Up until age 30, Jesus has a career. His career, he works in the carpentry shop of Joseph. He's a carpenter, a stonemason, a woodworker. That's his career. He did not need the Holy Spirit to come upon him to do a job. Now, you should have the Holy Spirit upon you in your workplace, absolutely. But unfortunately, you can do your job without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You cannot do your calling of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, you will not discern your calling without submitting to the Spirit's will. And in submitting to the Spirit's will and discovering your calling, discovering, listen, the things that you're uniquely called by God to do, the things that you're passionate about, the things that, that cause you to, to cry, the things that cause you to laugh with great joy, the things that make you wake up in the morning to advance God's kingdom or stay up late to advance God's kingdom. And listen, each of you has been distinctly designed by God, your own DNA, your own cloth, that the person next to you doesn't necessarily have the same interest, the same passion, the same calling as you do because God's designed each one of us uniquely. But you see, once you discover your calling, if, if you simply discover the calling, it's like, yeah, I, I really have a heart to do that. I want to do that. One day I'm going to do that. And you've been saying one day and one day and one day and that day never comes. It's because you have not yielded to the Spirit of God. In a week, we'll watch a game on TV, and if one team brings the ball from their own goal line 98 yards so that it's resting now at the one or two yard line of their opponent, that's a great drive in football. But you get no points for bringing the ball to the one yard line. All it does is cause people to groan, people to be grieved. Oh, that was an awesome drive. 99 yards, and we got stopped at the one yard line. There's nothing glorious about that. It's grieving, it's frustrating, it's quenching. And similarly, when, when a, a person has been designed by God to walk in their calling to advance God's kingdom, feel stirred, and yet they quench the spirit, they grieve the spirit so that they never actually do what God has called them to do. God is grieved. The spirit of God is quenched. There's nothing glorious about that. And too many of us, because we are not controlled by the Spirit of God or filled with the Spirit of God, find ourselves living in marriages that are dominated by our flesh, family relationships where the Spirit of God is not controlling, workplaces that are grievous because our flesh is dominating and not discovering or doing our calling. And yet, because we regularly come to church, we regularly open our Bibles, we regularly pray, we, we wonder what's missing. Because I, I'm doing things, but something seems to be missing. 
Why aren't I satisfied? Why does this seem so heavy? Because we're trying to do it in our flesh. We weren't designed to do it that way. It's like taking a power steering car and, and having no power steering fluid and, and trying to drive that car. And it's just a struggle and it's just a labor. We need the Spirit of God. So we've talked uh, in the first couple of weeks as we've entered into the book of Acts that the filling of the Spirit, that it's distinct from salvation. It can happen at the same time as salvation. It happens frequently subsequently to salvation. The most common manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is boldness to share your faith. When the Spirit of God is upon you, you just want to tell other people that you love Jesus. Even family members who have been opposed to your faith, even friends who you know, oh gosh, here we go with the old Jesus thing again. We have to do the Jesus thing again. Oh yeah, I got to tell you about Jesus, you know, because you're telling me about what you're into. I'm going to tell you about what I'm into. Okay, fine, get it out. So we can watch the game. Baptism of the Spirit, you, you find yourself uh, that you're just sensitive, that God, 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 you want me to talk to that person, and I'm afraid to do it. I don't know what I'm going to say, and I, I don't know how they're going to respond, but if you put on my heart, I should talk to that person. I, I'm going to want to do that and see what you're going to do. I just want to encourage you. You know, there's something, there's powerful experience. That's a wonderful experience to step out in boldness. I, I was uh, sitting in a coffee house uh, one weekend, and uh, relatively early in the day, and this couple at another table next to me is arguing, man, and it's, it's a passionate argument, and, and it's just getting really intense, and it was really awkward, and it was really loud, and, and so I, I walk over, and I say, you know, excuse me, I couldn't help but overhearing, you know, I'm trying to be polite, you know, it's like I could hear this thing in Oxnard from Camarillo, <laughs> I'm just trying to be polite. And this guy gets up. He's like one of the largest human beings I've ever seen. He's like, <laughs> like this eclipse. You know, just standing in front of me. And he goes, it's none of your business. And like, okay, no. <laughs> and I just go, actually, it is my business. You know, God just put in my heart, I I'm supposed to speak to you. I, I wrote a book on marriage. I'm a pastor. And God wants to heal this relationship. And this guy just sits down and says, okay, what do you got for us? <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get to live another day, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's something powerful when, when you, you know you're afraid, you know it's awkward, you know it's uncomfortable, you're unsure what's going to happen, and yet the Spirit of God prompts you and says, go, do, speak, represent me. And you find yourself stirred to, to reach out to someone in a way that you wouldn't normally in your flesh. It's a powerful experience. It's a wonderful experience. Now next to boldness to, to share our, our faith in Christ, the next most common manifestation that we hear about in the New Testament is tongues. At verse 4, And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What is tongues? Well, we read in the first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that tongues is a prayer or praise language that is directed up to God. It is spoken in a language that's unknown to the speaker. It may be known to other people, in other words, an earthly language, or it may be something that might sound unintelligible to anyone on this earth, but is the language inspired by heaven. Now, do all people receive the gift of tongues when they've been filled with the Holy Spirit? The Apostle Paul makes clear, no, that is not the case. I, I got a, a call from a lady a few weeks ago, and uh, she was in a panic. This is what was going on. Uh, she, she said, I, I think I might be going crazy. And it's like, oh, well, welcome to the club. No. I, was, <laughs> no, I said, why? What, what happened? She goes, I was praying, I started to pray, and all of a sudden as I was praying for a while, I just started speaking gibberish for like 20 or 30 seconds, and it was so weird, it never happened to me before. Am I going crazy? And I said, no, I think God just gave you the gift of tongues. We'll talk more, explain it more. God just, she wasn't seeking it, wasn't asking it for it, God just poured out. And, and so 
The, the gift of tongues in, in the context of, of public worship, Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40, he says, all things are to be done decently and in order. And so in very Pentecostal places of worship, the, they focus on the first part, all things. And so if you want to swing from the chandelier, all things. And, and in places where the Holy Spirit is not welcomed, decently and in order. We want to put a box around and God, you fit in the box and don't do anything outside of the box that we've created. And I would suggest to you, God does not want to be put in a box. If he wanted to be put in a box, then Indiana Jones would have brought forth the Ark of the Covenant. God is not desiring to be put in a box right now. And what it is is both. It's all things that are manifest that there's a biblical basis for done decently and in order. And, and so God is not going to interrupt himself. If in the middle of teaching that is Lord willing, inspired by God, God is not going to stand up and interrupt himself with a word of prophecy or a declaration in tongues. Does that mean that we don't want to see the gift of tongues or a gift of prophecy or other gifts exercised in the body? Far from it. Let me encourage you. In times where we're praising God as a body, as God just gives you the gift of tongues or has given you the gift of tongues, declare your praise to God. Declare your praise to God. As people, we up here to pray for you to receive and pray with you. If you have been blessed with a gift to give a praise to God in tongues, then use that gift and delight. And I also encourage you, we have prayer gatherings, times where believers are coming in and pressing in. Come exercise those gifts, especially when someone has the gift of interpretation of tongues, that we could all be blessed to understand what God spoke through you by his spirit to the praise and glory of God. Use the gifts. And, and so receiving the gift of tongues is not the litmus test of whether you've been baptized in the Spirit and it doesn't make you more spiritual than someone who doesn't have the gift of tongues. It is simply a very common manifestation of the gift of tongues. But here's what we need to see and I want to encourage you to write this down. The filling of the Spirit shall be manifest uniquely in each life to transform you to represent Christ and others shall see the Spirit manifest. The Spirit will be manifest in such a way that it's unique to you. And it will empower you to live to represent God and serve God. And others are going to see the change in you. So when you pray to receive the filling of the Spirit, you might have some manifestation, like a, a sense of just complete peace. You might have a sense of like liquid waves of love flowing over you. You might sense warmth. You might sense cold. You, you might sense nothing. But God has promised to pour out his spirit to those who are seeking. And when the spirit has been poured out, you will be transformed. You'll be transformed in your marriage. You'll be transformed in your family. You'll be transformed in the workplace, in your school, in your community that people are going to see. As a relatively new believer, I prayed to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. At this time, I was serving God. But I, I was also a, a trial attorney, and I was involved in this complex case, and I, I went a few weeks later to take a deposition of a witness. It was part two. A few months earlier, I had taken part one. Now, what happened between part one and part two was I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So during a break in part two, she said, you know, last time when we got together, you seemed mean and angry. I think you had a bad day because you're nicer today. <laughs> And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm losing my edge as an attorney. You know, as attorneys, we wake up in the morning and, and we don't brush our teeth. We file our tongue, sharpen that thing. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to be ineffective to do my job. But to the contrary, I was far more effective than I ever was. So the point was, here was this woman who knew nothing about me except that she could see clearly that something had changed. It wasn't facial hair, it wasn't new glasses, it wasn't a, a new hairstyle. Something about my very person had changed and it was manifest and it was observable. When the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon your life, others are going to see it just as clearly as they could see the cloven tongues of fire. Then last, the need for the baptism of the Spirit to represent God and serve together. The need of the baptism of the Spirit to represent God and to serve together. Here, what we discover is, is it's a picture of the reversal of what took place in the Tower of Babel. 
In Genesis chapter 11, man is rebelling against God. Says, we'll build a tower all the way up to heaven so it'll declare our praise, our glory. God doesn't want man stealing his glory. And so what does God do to stop that? He confounds the language of the workers so that they cannot work together and disperses them. Here at Pentecost, God unites the language by his spirit. So it's a model that what took place at Babel has been reversed so that now we can work together in commonality, in community. Let me tell you why we oftentimes don't want to serve with other Christians besides the fact that we're selfish. One of the reasons we don't want to serve with other people is because they're not like us. You see, if they were just like us and everything was in common, then it would be no challenge to serve. You see, the, that people who don't have Christ in them, will serve with other people who are just like them because that's not a challenge, that's a joy. When you're serving with people who are different than you, that's a challenge. Marriage is a challenge because you have two people who are very different, who have to unite as one in intimacy to actually serve together to advance God's kingdom. So do you know why most people don't get involved in serving God? It's not because they, their schedule doesn't allow it. It's not because they lack the ability or gifts. And it's not that they're completely selfish people. The reason is, is that we're dominated by our flesh rather than being controlled by the Spirit. And so when the Spirit of God prompts us to get involved in serving and using the gifts that God's given us, we say, well, maybe, maybe one day. And we grieve the Spirit of God instead of being filled with the Spirit of God. And so the first question we want to consider about the baptism of the Spirit is, what does it mean? The second thing to consider is the crowd's response and our response. First, if you would, take a look with me, beginning at verse 5. There's dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together, were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthi uh, Parthians and Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Here they are amazed that people from all over the Roman Empire have come to Jerusalem and as they've gathered in Jerusalem, here are these Galileans who don't know any foreign language who are praising God in all these diverse languages of all these different peoples from throughout the Roman Empire. There's something manifest, something happening that they recognize God's hand is upon it. There's a story that's told that when uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, in its early days, as Pastor Chuck was ministering, there was a, a gathering in a time that people were praying. And as someone started to pray in the spirit, in tongues, that they just started offering up this praise to God. And a, a man came forward afterwards, and he started to speak to this other man in French because as this utterance in tongues was being lifted up to God, it was in French. And what he discovered as the guy looked like a deer in the headlights, he said, I don't speak a word of French. I had no idea what I was saying. And the first man said, oh, the praises that you were declaring of God, and it was beautiful French, and it wasn't the French of common people. It was the French of aristocracy, the royal French. And Pastor Chuck said that seems appropriate because he was praising one who is king of kings and lord of lords. That man who came and did not know the Lord yet, surrendered his life to God because he saw what was being manifest and he recognized that this was of God. And he gave his hand and his heart to the Lord. But some were perplexed and some were curious to say, what does it mean? And even others mocked. We see it, verse 12. They were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? And others mocked, saying, Oh, they're full of new wine. In other words, they're drunk. And so today, 
right here, hundreds of people, those who are, are watching the teaching, those who are listening to the teaching. Some are, are marveling, yes, I, I understand the Holy Spirit now more than I ever did, and I, I want that, I need that. And some are curious. I, I don't understand everything about the Holy Spirit, this whole church thing, this whole Bible thing, this whole God thing, and Jesus thing. Is, it's all kind of new to me. And now you're talking about the Holy Spirit, and what exactly is it? I'm curious. I want it, but there's a little bit of fear and apprehension. If I surrender my life to God, what's going to happen? Is it going to be good or something to be afraid of? And then, uh, unfortunately... There's some who'd even mock, oh, you know, forget this. There is no God. It's just a fairy tale. What's he talking about? Those people who, who I, I've seen on YouTube are crazy. That's not of God. And maybe in those cases, you were right. But don't throw out the living water of truth, but the bath water of the false. And so as these people see this and they're curious, they wonder, what does it all mean? And Peter begins, and we'll see this next week, to explain. And so at verse 37, they ask the question, what shall we do? And you see, this is, is the critical question. People want to know, how can I receive the power of the Spirit? How can I be right with God so that I could live for God? And so I want to, if I may, ask you to write down to receive and here's what we need to do. First of all, you need to yield to Christ and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're called to repent, to turn from our sin, to turn our, to God, to change our thinking about our sin and our thinking about God to get right with God. That we're no longer controlled by our flesh. And I want to encourage you, as I encourage myself, each of us probably has an area of our life that there's something that God wants us to be doing that we've resisted doing. And similarly, each of us has an area in our life where, where God is encouraging us to stop doing something that we know is not pleasing to God. We've justified it. We've excused it. We've looked to the letter of the law while clearly avoiding the spirit of the law rather than surrendering to God. We harden our hearts so that we won't feel guilty. We grieve the spirit because we won't submit to his control. We quench the spirit and say, stop saying that, God. I'm just going to keep on doing it. And I just, you know, I know for me, that when I prayed and asked God to show me, it didn't take long for him to reveal that area in my life that needed to change. Do you want to know what it is? Of course you do, because you're controlled by your flesh. No. 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 Don't worry about my thing. It's, each of us has to worry about our own thing, amen? Don't worry about your neighbor's thing, your spouse's thing, your kid's thing, your friend's thing. Oh, I wish my neighbor was here. They really need to hear this. Well, you need to hear it. So what do we do? Well, we pray to receive the baptism of the Spirit, as we're told in Luke 11, Acts chapter 1. And we trust whether something is manifest, a certain feeling, or, or whether we don't feel anything special, we trust that God will do as he's promised to do. And as we receive the Spirit, we seek to glorify Christ and be led by his Spirit. We yield. We're not going to grieve the Spirit. We're not going to quench the Spirit. And I'm going to give you a chance right now to pray with me, to ask God to move by His Spirit. If you guys could just close your eyes and open your hearts. First thing, if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, we all need to understand that each of us has been separated from our Creator, from God, because we're sinners. We have all sinned, and all sin against God is deserving of judgment, separation from God. And yet, because of God's love for you and for me, Christ came to take the penalty for our sin, so that if we would surrender our life to Christ and, and submit to Him, that because of faith of what Christ has done for us and the grace of God, unmerited favor, that God has promised to give us life by his spirit, that we would be born again, regenerated, born again, that we could live for God. And so the first step is you have to surrender your life to Christ. 
But then in surrendering your life to Christ, along the way in the process of walking with him in your journey and my journey, we discover that there's areas of our life where we're not submitted to God. Things he wants us to do that we don't do. Things that he wants us to stop doing that we continue to do. And we have to bring those areas and lay them at the altar of Christ and ask him to fill us with his spirit to empower us. And then as we continue to walk with Christ, we need the Spirit to discern, do I turn to the right, do I turn to the left, do I stay on course, do I go, do I stop? We need God's Spirit to lead us rather than the law. And so if you're here today and and you just sense that, that you want more, Maybe your marriage is fantastic and you want more. Maybe your family's fantastic and you want more. Maybe your career, your work is fantastic, you want more. Your calling is fantastic, you want more. Or maybe, maybe you're sensing that there's something missing and you want that to change today. I'm going to invite you, whether you're asking for the Holy Spirit for the first time or asking again, just to stand up with me so that we can pray. Just get up up at your seat right now while the people around you have their eyes closed and their hearts open. Just stand up. Don't worry about what the person next to you is doing. Don't worry about what anyone else is thinking. It's God's just sensing that you want more of him. Just stand up and let him know. I'm going to pray for us in a moment. It's not too late to stand up. As you're being stirred by the Spirit of God, not a sense of peer pressure because others stood, but just by the Spirit of God, you just sense, yes, I want that. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but I know that, God, you won't give me something that's harmful. And if you've said that I need this, Lord, I want it. And so just stand up right now that I can pray and we can receive. Father, by your Holy Spirit, would you fill this place with your presence? Lord, may you pour out upon each life here as an individual, just like the tongues of fire were upon each person's head as an individual. Lord, may we see transformed lives from those that that are here, Lord, and others where you're pouring out your Spirit, that we would give you glory through the changed lives. And Father, in seeing that transformation and others bringing to our attention that they see you manifest in our lives, Lord, that we would be encouraged that truly you are in us, truly you are upon us, truly you have filled us, and Lord, commission us to go out and represent you as your witnesses by your strength. Now we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.